Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, hello for the newcomers here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the first of a series of workshops on, on contracts. Uh, there already have been a few workshops for, for Defender, and this is part of an effort to, to address the needs of the community and to speak more publicly about how you can use it, provide tutorials. And today, the subject of these tutorials is to, to deal with the new, to work with the new clones library that you may have seen uh, appeared on the on the contract repo with version 3.4 lately and, and see how it can be useful. Uh, so here on the on the first slide, you'll see a link uh, zpl.in slash contracts dash workshop. Uh, this will be repeated later in the in the in the in the slides. Uh, but it's basically where you can find all the code that uh, that was used and will be shown during this workshop to produce metrics or if you want to to have a look at how it can be useful uh, this is this is a place to go okay so first i'd like to to speak very briefly about about uh, our mission at open zeppelin our, our mission is very important it's about protecting the open economy and and the security part of of open zeppelin is very important so you can see it in the smart contract we try to provide we try to provide toolings so that you can build secure apps uh, but that's not the all the entire extent of it. Uh, Open Zeppelin is also about uh, the defender part that we discussed a bit before the workshop. That providing tooling for you to monitor your smart contracts uh, to react to events that happen on chain. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also the security team of Open Zeppelin that is leading in uh, in the audit space. Uh, and so the idea is that with these three components of the company. Uh, you, you should find everything you need uh, for securing your infrastructure, your decentralized application, and having all the tools you need. So, so think about Open Zeppelin not only when you build contracts, but also later when you build your application. If you need audits, if you if you want to manage your your decentralized application, uh, Open Zeppelin has tooling for that. So uh, our subject today is is a clone feature, and this feature is particularly useful when you are dealing with families of smart contracts, which might be your case in your application. And so first we'll think about a few families of smart contracts out there that exist, that are used every day, and that could benefit from these clone features. The first one is Uniswap. Uh, Uniswap uh, in the version two, which is a current version, has over 20,000 registered pairs. So that means that there are 20,000 uh, liquidity pairs for the Uniswap protocol. And for those that may not be familiar with it, how Uniswap works is there is a component that is called the router, router that is useful to, to build complex operation of trading. But behind this router, what happens is there are liquidity pairs. And liquidity pairs are just smart contracts that knows about two tokens. For example, it could be DAI and USDC. And a liquidity pair just contain an equal proportion of both assets and has the capability of exchanging between one and the other. And so you have a liquidity pair for, uh, let's say, uh, wrapped is and DAI, and you have another for DAI and USDC, and you might have another for USDC versus, I don't know, like a maker. And so you can change those with a routine mechanism, but behind that, what, what exists is pair. And whenever you want to put a new asset on Uniswap, it's completely open and decentralized. You just have to create a pair and provide liquidity for that pair. And this obviously happened a lot, and this system is, is very successful in that extent. Another system that, that is interesting to have a look at, it's Argent. Uh, Argent, for those that don't know about it, is a mobile-based uh, smart wallet that allowed you to, allows you to hold uh, any ERC-20 or ERC-721s, as well as ETH, and also have a strong integration with DeFi. One of the key features of Argent is all your assets are held by a smart contract that is your own and that ensures like security in a programmable way. So it's completely non-custodial and you have social recovery mechanism, you have daily limit mechanism, you have a lot of interesting mechanism that are applied on chain. Uh, but again, what happens is that in both cases, like the adoption number, both the number of, of activation of Argent and the number of, of per for Uniswap, uh, directly implies that there are smart contracts that are being deployed on chain. And this can be very expensive. So if you have a look at this Uniswapper contract that I 
told you about earlier. This Uniswap pair uh, is the one that is between USDC and, and, uh, and ETH. So it might not be very visible for you because this is a bit small maybe, but this contains $200 million worth of assets. Half of that is wrapped is, the other half is USDC. And deploying this smart contract uh, costs uh, two and a half million gas, which might have been decently cheap at the time this was deployed at the beginning of Uniswap V2, but today, in today's money, basically based on, on today's gas price and today's ETH price, this is over $500 for deploying the pearl. And so you can see that deploying a smart contract when it's worth, when it's cost to $500, it can make sense when it's a liquidity pearl, it's going to have a lot of trades. But if you have your new ERC20 that you want to make available through Uniswap, uh, it will cost you a lot to just have it available on Uniswap by creating a pair and providing liquidity. So this is something that people might not like, and maybe it will limit further adoption of Uniswap for tokens that have low trading volumes. Same for Argent, right? So this is an Argent wallet that I found by just having a look at the factory. We'll go on the, on the factory aspect a bit later. But basically, this was deployed by Argent for a user, and this is for one specific user. And when I went, when I had a look at this wallet, it just had about two dollars worth of fees stored on this wallet. However, deploying it cost over two hundred dollars. That means that every time there is a new user that's onboarding the Argent ecosystem, Argent pays the gas for this user, and this costs them over two hundred dollars. I think this is very, very expensive to onboard new user. Hopefully, that they will be able to. This makes some economical sense. But again, the recent gas price and ETH price makes it not very practical. And if this is like your onboarding process, if you want to create a token for a, not a token, a contract for a user as an onboarding process, uh, it can be very expensive. And this is where the clone library will be useful for you. So why is it so expensive uh, to deploy a smart contract? This is a big question behind the clone that justifies the existence of the clone library. Usually, when you deploy a smart contract to just initiate a transaction, this costs 20, 21,000 gas. It's like mandatory for all transactions. And then you create a smart contract and you call the constructor. And this is very expensive. And the reason why this is very expensive is because it's storing data on chain. And storage on chain is the most expensive part. Uh, in the case of creating a new smart contract, the cost is proportional to the square of the size in terms of bytecode of a smart contract. And then once you've stored the bytecode, if your contract has a constructor, you have to run this constructor and usually that sets some variable that stored some values, uh, which is expensive. And so this is basically what it looks like. It's pretty simple. A user creates or use creates to, which you cannot do directly, but, but that's the same logic. Uh, an instance, and then the constructor runs. And later, you are able to just call this smart contract. And when you call a smart contract, it, the, the call is very direct. There is no indirection. So there is no overhead. You just have to pay the, the cost of the, of the call, which is might be expensive, but you don't have any overhead. Uh, so the second approach, uh, which you might be familiar with, is that of using proxies. And proxies have a lot of, of interesting use cases. Uh, there is a use case around upgradability, but there is also a use case around cost in the sense that if you already have the logic behind the proxies and you just have to deploy a new proxy, the proxy will have a constructor and the constructor will call an initialized function in the underlying, underlying logic, but the underlying logic only has to be, uh, to be deployed once. So if the, the instance, like the logic already exists, you just have to create a proxy, call the constructor, and then the constructor will do an initialization function on the on the on the underlying logic. Uh, and if you have a big family of smart contracts, uh, this can be pretty uh, pretty nice. And this is in fact what Argent is using. Argent doesn't deploy a brand new wallet for everybody. They have a logic for the wallet that has been deployed once and for all. And what they do is they deploy a, a new proxy for every user. However, the proxy, while they have features like sometimes upgradability, one of the drawbacks is that often uh, the, um, the implementation address, so the address of the underlying logic that is to be executed, uh, is stored in the storage part of the contract. 
there is a storage slot dedicated for that. And this means that whenever you want to do a transaction through a proxy, the proxy has to read this address from storage before being able to delegate. And this adds a cost uh, to the execution compared to the first model. Here, the, the additional cost uh, is divided in two parts. The first part is reading from storage, and the second part is actually doing the delegate code. And so this is where uh, maybe we can do a bit better and have a similar approach to the proxy logic uh, using a clone mechanism. And clone is de described in uh, EIP 1167. Sometimes it's called a minimal proxy as well. Um, and so the idea here is that the clone will be like a proxy, but way smaller without some features like upgradability, but with also a much lower deployment cost. And the first thing is here, you can see that the clone doesn't have a constructor. By design, it's very, very small. You just deploy it. And when you deploy it, you deploy it in a way where the address of the, of the logic is built into the bytecode of the clone. So whenever you are going to use the clone later on, there is no reading from storage. It's just delegating directly. And this means it's a bit less expensive to, to do this operation. Uh, more particularly with Berlin, we know that the, the cost of using storage, both reading from storage and writing to storage, will increase. So here, a clone uh, has a better efficiency uh, than, than a proxy. Uh, it's still not as efficient as directly calling a smart contract, like, uh, like a, a standalone smart contract, but it's also way less expensive to deploy it. But the clone has been built in a way that the bytecode of the clone is the smallest possible. Uh, therefore, the, the deployment of the clone uh, is also as cheap as possible, which usually is the, 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 the expensive part of, of a deployment. So we'll have a look at some demo demonstration with some code. Uh, again, here is a link to the to the to the code. So if just right now or later you want to, to have a look at the code, see how it works. And, and take that as an example, feel free to have a look at, at this repository where you will find resources for all the workshop that, that we're doing at OpenZeppelin. So let's open first this example. And here we, we'll go down to three examples. First one will just be deploying a simple ERC20 tokens. And once we've seen how clones can be useful for that, then we will see how we can modify Uniswap and Argent wallets as we saw them previously and see how how the developers or are at Uniswap or at Argent could have used clone if, if they have wanted and why they may or may not want to do it. So this is a pretty naive factory that most really developer will be able to understand. And here is just a factory that is going to create a new RC20 tokens. So we've heard that just before the call use case of I think it was car that was talking about deploying bounding curve. Maybe some of you guys want to deploy families of your C20s. And here in this case, we are just taking one of the presets provided by Open Zeppelin uh, in the contract upgradable package. A very quick word on this contract upgradable package. You might be familiar with Open Zeppelin dash contracts, uh, sorry, slash contract, but there is also Open Zeppelin slash contracts dash upgradable. This is a small variation of the contract you're familiar with where the constructor is replaced with an initialized function. This is pretty useful if you want to build uh, contracts uh, that have an initializing mechanism. For example, if you want to build contracts that are used with or uh, upgradable uh, uh, script and package for hard hat, this is a library you may want to have a look at. And so this factor is pretty naive in the sense that it just has a create token uh, function. And this create token function will just create a new token uh, and then just call the initialize function with the parameters that, that, we, that we send them. And this will just create an ERC20 with a name, a symbol, an initial supply, and an initial owner. And then once that is deployed, you can train your token. It's fully ERC20 compliant. So this is pretty expensive to run because this new operation here creates a new smart contract that contains the entire logic every time. And this is the expensive part. So we'll see that with proxy, we are able to do a bit better. And this proxy factory, what it does is there is a constructor here that will deploy uh, an, an initial version that will act as a template that will only be useful used for the logic. Uh, we don't really care about what the storage of this contract is. And we store that as what we call our token implementation. 
And then later, whenever a user wants to create a token, then rather than creating a new ERC20, we create an upgradable proxy. And we give this upgradable proxy the address of the token implementation and an encoded version of the initialized function. So this is the initialized function selector with some parameters here. So this is basically the same as calling the initialized function from within the constructor of the upgradable proxy. If you want to, to remove that and to put an empty byte, you can just uh, call the initialized function later on the next line just here. Uh, but here we see how it's possible to, to change that so that the contract is both deployed and initialized in an atomic way. And so this is a bit better because we don't have to redeploy the entire ERC20 every time. Uh, on the other hand, we, we do have to deploy an upgradable proxy, uh, which is uh, not as expensive, but still more expensive than a clone. And in the case where we don't need the upgradability mechanisms uh, and the upgradable proxy by itself doesn't really have it, you'd have to have an upper class of, of uh, upgradable proxy, something like our transparent proxy to benefit from, from upgradability. So if upgradability is not like something you want to use, uh, then you can just use a clone mechanism. And here we can see that the code is pretty similar. The only difference here is that like the clone is as simple as calling the clone library with the address of the implementation, and then call the initialized function separately, something we could have done, as I said, with a proxy, but that in this case, we don't have no other choice than, than doing that, because deploying a clone will not execute any code. It will just deploy the clone, and that's it. But in the case of a factory, it's not really a concern. You can see that uh, this create token will still uh, do both operations uh, at the same time. So let's have a look at, at, at this working. So I'll just run a test that uh, that runs all those uh, those factories to deploy ERC20s, and I will also do a transfer operation on these ERC20s. And you can see here this this is outputted by uh, the hard hat module called ETH Gas Reporter. This is something if you're not familiar with, you can have a look at. Uh, it's documented on the hard hat. Um, website and it's pretty useful if you want to have information about the gas consumptions of your contracts and, and different functions. What we can see first is the deployment cost. The deployment costs are in the bottom part. And here we can see that the naive uh, part the naive implementation is the cheapest one because the only thing it knows basically is that is a is a code of the of the RC20 and that's it. And the clone and the proxy also have to know the code of the RC20 because they are deploying it in their constructor. Uh, you could do this differently, but in this case, you, you need to know it. And there is also additional code that is needed. In the case of the clone, there is a clone library. In the case of the proxy, there is the code for the proxy as well. So here we see that. Uh, Okay, for just I see that in the in the in the chat someone is asking. This was just a, a, an npm run com, a, a hard hat test uh, command. So this is just hard hat test with a module that has been enabled. So if you want to know how to enable this module, uh, it's ETH gas reporter. Uh, you can find it on on hard hat, or you can also uh, see how it was configured in our in our repo. So this is the cost of deploying the factory, but again. The cost of deploying the factory is not necessarily where you are the most, uh, that's the most critical. What's critical is when you are going to use the factory. And here we see that the, the naive factory here, when you create a token with the naive factory, it costs over 1 million gas because you are deploying an entire ERC20 contract. And it's almost as expensive as the cost of deploying the factory in the first place. However, if you use a proxy instead, uh, you see that the cost is divided by, by something like four. And it goes to 300, uh, 360,000 gas, uh, which is still expensive, but way less expensive than one, uh, 1 million gas that we used before. And this proxy will have the same capability, it's an ERC20 that is compliant in the same way. But we can go further than that and use the clone with the factory clone that we saw previously. And here we see the cost went down to 200,000 gas. And this is deploying a fully comp working ERC20 tokens. It's just like, it's, a, it's through a clone, so the clone contract doesn't know the logic. It's just delegating the logic. But from a security standpoint, uh, while since our, our implementation or template has no self-destruct function in it, the security is the exact same. So there is no lack of security. It's just cheaper. 
However, something that we I discussed very quickly previously is that the fact that my, you may use a proxy or a clone uh, as extra mechan extra like delegation calls whenever you try to use this function this contract. So here we we have the cost of creating the contract as well as the cost of doing an ERC twenty transfer on the previous contract. And you can see that while the naive approach was the most expensive uh, in terms of deployment, it's also the cheapest when you do a call because you directly call the logic. If you were to call the, the clone, it will be a bit more expensive, about 800 gas more, uh, which is roughly the cost of a delegate call. A delegate call is 700 gas. So there is also something like 100 gas of memory copying when you do the delegate call and that's it. Uh, but the, so the use of a proxy is even more expensive than the clone. Here there is an additional almost a thousand gas. That is because of the fact that the proxy has to read from storage to know how to delegate the call, which the clone doesn't have to do. And so here you can see that there is a balance between deploying an entire new contract and, and deploying a clone, for example, because while the deployment, the initial deployment will be more expensive, the usage will be less expensive. So in the case of Uniswap, as we saw for with a pair like ETH versus USDC, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of code to that contract every day. So while the deployment was more expensive for the community in the long run, it's, it's, it's cheaper. So it makes sense. Uh, but this economical uh, uh, thinking makes sense for big pairs. But again, if you want to deploy a Uniswap pair for us, a ERC20 that has very low volume, maybe you, win, you won't have enough usage to, to make up for the initial deployment cost. Uh, as for the proxy part, we can see that uh, clone is cheaper than proxy, both for deployment and for usage. So unless you are using additional mechanism in the proxy contract, like the upgradability part, uh, clone is just the way to go. If your proxies are designed not to be upgradable, I don't think there is any good reason uh, not to, to use a clone, unless like your proxy has like a mechanism to split the call between different uh, implementations, uh, like a router proxy, something like that, which is way beyond uh, beyond the, 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 the topic today. But that's that was a question earlier before the, the talk as well. So so proxy have additional feature that might be interesting in some cases. But if it's just delegating a logic to a single endpoint and not using upgradability. I don't think you should use a proxy. You should just go ahead with a clone. So the next thing I wanted to show you here is uh, what we could have done uh, if we were the Uniswap developers. So the question is, how more difficult would, I, would it have been if we wanted to be a to do a clone? So on the on the right part, uh, you have the the Uniswap code for the Uniswap V2 factory, which is a part of Uniswap that creates the, the Uniswap pair that we discussed. And there is this create pair function here that basically verifies that token are valid and do some stuff. And here there is a part where there is a call to create two. So those few lines uh, are the part that is going to create the pair. And that might look complicated. So if, if you not, don't follow this, this, don't worry. You will have time. You will have more information interesting later. And you will be able to catch that on the, on the, on the, on the, on the GitHub repo where all this code is available. But I just wanted to show you that like here, it's just as simple as, as forking the code. And, and here, this line 33 where they do a clone deterministic, this is basically a, a a copy of, of this function that use create2. And here we see that Uniswap uses create2 to have predictable address. We're able to do the same with our clones. It's just pretty simple. There is a initialized function here that is the same here. So not that many changes. One of the major changes is that we had to provide the address of the implementation in the constructor so that the contract, the factory, well, was able to store it so that later we were able to do this clone deterministic part rather than redeploying create2 with a bytecode. And here we can see that the bytecode is directly the creation code from the Uniswap pair. So this is very expensive, as we saw previously. And so if we go back to our, our test environment and have a look at, uh, at the second test, the second test basically does the deployment of a Uniswap um, uh, pair, so yeah, a token pair, uh, using both the uh, Uniswap version and my modified version that uses clone. And here you can see that, well, Uniswap v2 uses uh, 
their factory, which is about two and a half million gas. And in my case, I was I needed to deploy a slightly modified version of the pair, again available in GitHub if you want to have a look at this, and the modified version of the factory. And when you add the two costs, it's about the same. So the initial deployment cost is pretty similar. What's very different is later when you want to create a pair. Uh, here it costs about 2 million gas. So it's a bit different from the 2.5 million we saw previously because the optimization mechanisms are not exactly configured the same way. But it's just a rough idea of the cost. It's about 2 million gas to deploy a pair. And here we see that with a clone, it's about 200,000 gas. So we save almost 90% when moving from the current Uniswap code to a clone version. Again, there is a downside every time you you call the pair to do a swap. It will be a bit more expensive. So maybe in the long run, you prefer paying this cost. But I'm sure some people would prefer a Uniswap that is cheaper to create new pairs because they want to, to manipulate tokens that won't be used that much, but that you still want to trade in a decentralized way. Uh, last but not least, we'll, we'll have a look at the... Okay, we'll have a look at the, at the argent case. And as I told you, in the case of Argent, the, the, the Argent team already deploys proxy. So this, like the code is even more, more similar. And just to show you how similar it is, I will just enable like diff view in this file. So again, on the right side, you have the Argent code from their latest uh, Git repository, not exactly what they use on chain. Uh, it's, it's like this is not what they use yet, but it's already available on the GitHub. And on the left part is a version I modified. Obviously, I've modified all the import parts because my code is not in their tree file. But apart from that, I've just modified the, the contract name. And somewhere in the create contractual wallet, I modified this code, which is new proxy, with this, which is clone deterministic. I will remove this overnight so you can see it's clear to see. But this line is the only line that was modified. Here, you can see that we use clone deterministic again, because this is a contrafactual deployment. And while they basically create a proxy using this salt syntax, that is the way to tell Solidity to use create2. So basically, this was almost the only difference between these two files. Another difference is that they have a function to predict the address, the contrafactual address. And again, what they do is they, they re-encode the way create2 address are determined. And in our case, we can just use a predict deterministic address functions from the clone library. So this change was very minor. And, and let's see how, how, it, how it works. So let's use our third use case, our Argent one. Same, it's going to configure an Argent ecosystem with a few modules uh, and use a factory to create uh, different wallets. And so again, here we see that there is a wallet factory that is Argent uh, factory. And it costs about 300,000 gas to to deploy a wallet. This is way more expensive than what they're currently using because their latest code basically tries to, to save gas. But they could do even better if they were using our library because we can see that with the wallet clone, uh, the, the wallet factory clone, uh, the same function would have been a bit cheaper, about like something like 60,000 gas less, which is like 60,000 gas might not sound that much, but that's a cost they have to pay for every new user they onboard. Uh, so I think that they could definitely use this kind of saving. And in their cases, it's not replacing a basic contract with a clone. It's replacing a proxy with a clone. So it will also reduce the cost of usage of the Argent platform later on for their user or for them if they sponsor a transaction, which is actually new. So, OK. Uh, so you've seen a lot of code. Uh, let's go back to the basics. What's in the this library that I'm Telling you about in the beginning, this library is available in OpenZeppelin contract under the proxy repository. It's called clones. And basically, there is the clone function that will just create a new clone using the create mechanism. This cannot revert. It will always succeed. There is also a clone deterministic that takes a salt for contrafractual mechanism. You see that it's necessary if you want to replicate uh, um, Uniswap or Argent behavior. And there are a predict deterministic address mechanism that, sorry, the clone deterministic function, just to finish on that one, this one can revert. Uh, if you ask twice to create a clone of the same address with the same byte, uh, the second time it will not work. 
So, so unlike the clone one, you have to make sure that the salt is unique, otherwise you will have issues. Uh, however, why, but basically since address plus salt uh, you returns a, 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 a unique address, you are able to predict that using the predict deterministic address. And there is also a, a, a second version of the implementation, the salt, but also the address of the deployer. So you can even choose this library to know what would be the address of a clone if another contract uh, wanted to deploy it. That might be useful in, in some cases uh, in your applications. So let's go back to the number we saw. Like this is, this, those are the savings for deploying either a new Uniswapper or an Argent counterfactual wallet. And here we see that we gain a lot more in terms of fraction uh, when it's moving from a basic contract to a, to a clone, then from a proxy to a clone. But still, this more saving can make sense, uh, particularly in the case of Argent, when they deploy tens of thousands of instances of their wallets. So advantages and drawbacks of, of the clone, and this will be most, most the end of, of, the, of this talk. Uh, as you saw, clones are very cheap to deploy. So this is like the greatest advantage of, of, this, of this approach. Uh, and it's very easy to adapt uh, your, your application to deploy clones, in particular when if you were working with proxies before and you want to move to clone, as we saw in the Argent suit case, most of the time it's just one line that's changing. So that, that's, that's really good, I think. And also clones, uh, instead of proxy, uh, they save a lot of, of gas as well. I mean, not a lot, but a small amount of gas whenever you try to call the contract. And this amount of gas that is said is going to increase with the burning network upgrade uh, in April that will make drilling from storage more expensive. The only two drawbacks of the, of the clones is first that they are not upgradable. This is somehow a security feature, but it's also a limitation. So if you need upgradability, uh, you will not be able to use that. Uh, but like in the case of Argent, this is not an issue because wa Argent wallets are upgradable not because they upgrade the path of delegation, but because your proxy, that is your Argent wallet, delegates to a contract that has a modular mechanism in it. So if you think your, your upgradability patterns in terms of having a modular approach with whitelist and stuff like that, uh, then you can keep some form of upgradability even with a clone in front of that. And the other downside of the clone is that it's more expensive than calling a native contract. So this is why I think that Uniswap was somehow right not to use that for deploying pairs like, uh, like uh, ETH versus USDC, because the, the additional cost of every call would have been bigger to the communities and the initial cost of deployment. But some contracts are not used as much as this, obviously. So in some cases, you are you will accept to pay this additional fee for each call because it makes you save a lot of money uh, when you deploy the contract initially. So uh, open Zeppelin dash slash contract, this is a repo that you might be familiar with. Again, uh, it's not on this slide, but there is a contract upgradable we discussed previously. I encourage you to have a look at it if you are building an initializable mechanism with clones or proxies. And there is links to our documentation or forum and Defender, when you are going further with your application, when you want to deploy and monitor it, have a look at Defender. It's, it's a great tool. Thank you. Uh, again, some links, my, my contact. And, and I think we've got about uh, 15 minutes for questions.